nothing to do with, with COVID. Uh, and it could be that he's just got, I mean, I don't know, that he got a, a false positive on a test, or it could be that he has that to complicate things. But uh, because of that, uh, he's not here. He's in, he's in the hospital in, uh, in Winder. And uh, Emma's not here. She's remaining quarantined uh, for our sakes. But uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, Numbers chapter 21, and then basically some things of this foreshadowing that this does concerning the Christ. And here's one of the things about the Bible, and one of the things about literature, is in literature there's a lot of foreshadowing, especially in things like novels, there's a lot of foreshadowing of where you have the author put something uh, in the first part of the book, and that kind of hints at something else, but you probably don't even realize it. It, it's ta- it, it's uh, looking forward to something you haven't even come across yet. You don't know it's there until you find it, and then you realize, oh, well, these two things kind of, one is kind of a shadow of another. Well, the Bible is, there's a lot of that. Matter of fact, it's been several years ago that we spent an entire quarter talking about types and shadows, of uh, shadows found earlier in the New Testament, uh, such as the Passover or uh, such as that of uh, even the, the flood itself. Uh, both those things uh, showing uh, something, uh, a shadow of the real thing, the shadow of something greater that was to come. Uh, but let's begin now in, in Numbers chapter 21. Uh, we begin in verse 4 again. And we have Israel in the wilderness And Israel, in the wilderness, on occasion, they become very impatient. They become, uh, it wasn't too long ago that we were uh, discussing uh, Exodus chapter 17, of where Moses is thinking they're going to kill him. They they are ready to stone me. Those are his words. Uh, Whether they were or not, don't know, but he thought they were, and he said they were contending with him. And he tells them that they were, in fact, testing the Lord. Well, they're up to it again. Have they learned nothing? Well, let's understand they are human just like the rest of us. And let's understand that they're not any different than any other people, really. Uh, That uh, we can be just as mindless, just as ungrateful, just as impatient as they were, but there are some things that we really need to look at in this, as well as the the foreshadowing that is taking place. But Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. They were impatient. They, it's just, it's a hardship. They're being tested. That's what tests are. If you think that you can go through this life and have no test whatsoever, and somehow this life is just going to be a breeze, it's not going to be. There are going to be tests. And if you think that the Christian life is going to be a breeze, it's not. Christ does not say that. Matter of fact, He says the opposite. While he will protect his own, yes, he does, but we will be tested. Was not Peter tested? Was not Paul tested? And and Paul gives us a list of the things that he went through concerning perils in the city and perils in the wilderness, perils among false brethren. He gives a a list of numerous things of shipwrecks and being cold and without clothes and uh, in hunger and in thirst, all these things would be part of a test, and they're being tested again. Will they remain loyal to God? Have they learned their lessons? Well, not so much. Because we see, verse 5, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why? And here is their usual tack. This is what they usually say. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. Now we've talked about this on occasion, matter of fact, not too long ago, I guess Wednesday we were, concerning uh, Exodus 17 with them saying this, that 
it's a charge against God is what it is. And that if God wanted them dead, he would just have killed them in Egypt and left the Egyptians alone. Why bring them out and have to bring them out with a strong hand to kill them in the wilderness? Well, this is, they're, they're under a test to see if they were, will remain loyal to God. And we will see that at, from Exodus chapter 16, when they were hungry, God fed them with manna. And we've spoken on it before. That would have to be the world's most perfect, the world's perfect food. Uh, there are, are certain things that if you eat and you have a diet of just that, uh, you will have a problem, uh, such as a diet of, of just bread. That's it. Uh, just, just wheat and, and that, wheat and whatever it took, water, whatever it took to make that bread. All right. If you just have that, there, there are going to be uh, certain nutritional sections, certain sections of nutrition you won't be getting. And you can get scurvy. Uh, if you, certain B vitamin, I can't recite them at the moment, but certain B vitamin, if you don't get that, well, you're going to get berry berry. There are, there are things that one can get from malnutrition, but they're eating only manna. Manna is what they've been had, what they've been having day after day and year after year. But it is miraculous. They don't have to do any farming. They don't have to plant a thing, water a thing. They don't have to do any of that. All they have to do is gather it up in the morning, except on the Sabbath, where they would have gathered it up on Friday, twice as much on Friday for the Sabbath. The, all of this would have been supplied for them. Every day they see the miracle of God feeding them in a place where it would be impossible to have a large civilization. You can't have a large city in the middle of that wilderness. There's not enough water. There's not enough uh, land that you could, you could have a farm, a permanent farm. There's, there's not enough anything like that. But he is feeding them and feeding them miraculously every day. Every day they wake up and there it is. But they begin to take this for granted because we see in verse 5, and the, speak, and the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. Well, it's that worthless bread that's there miraculously every morning. It's that worthless bread that's been keeping you alive and has, holds everything nutritionally that you need. Holds everything you need, and you're calling it worthless bread. This is given to you by God, and you call it worthless bread. This is given because God knows precisely what you need, and now you're complaining against Him again. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. Well, what, what happened to the wonder of it? What happened to it? It's, it's gone. What happened to the gratitude of it? That God can take them out of Egypt, a place that's well watered, lots of crops, lots of, uh, you've, got, you've got fish, you've got cattle, you have all these things. Egypt, Egypt would have been one of those places that would have received all kinds of goods from uh, around the Mediterranean. All kinds of things would have been there. He takes them out from that well-watered place into, into this wilderness and can take care of them. And you know that the Egyptians would be wondering, as well as would other nations be wondering, how are they living inside there? They've got to be dropping like flies in there. You can't just have that many people camp there year after year. You can't, but they are. And here he gives them manna, but it, to them it becomes worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, verse 6, and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Here's a scattering of the bodies in the wilderness. 
Here they are murmuring against God, complaining against Him, contending with Moses, and they haven't learned their lesson yet. Why not? Because they're, things get the better of them. They become hard-headed. They become uh, ungrateful. They, they become just this, this people that, that they turn vicious again, just like, like with, with Moses, thinking they're, they're going to stone him. And Moses saying, why do you try the Lord? Why, why are you, you trying him? And now they're doing it again. And God sends these fiery serpents that, you know, it, maybe it's time, maybe it's time to show a little bit more gratitude. But verse 7, verse 7 rather, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now they, they come to their senses. Okay, who you, who you been talking to? Moses? Yeah. You know, okay, Moses by himself is nothing, but you're complaining against God, your creator, our creator, God who created, who created that manna, also created the rivers, also created the oceans, also created everything to sustain life. He's been sustaining your life every step of the way, and somehow with the slightest glitch, not, not glitch, no, nope, the wrong word, somehow with the slightest problem, what happened to the faith that should come every morning with that manna? The manna is delivered every morning. What happened to the faith that, that would be based off of that manna and more that God has done? God's going to take care of them. God took care of them in Egypt. God took care of them through the Red Sea. He's taken care of them all these years and more. He's going to do it. And if God, they have seen God angry before, why do you want to anger Him again? Why do you want to pose the same kind of thing? Oh, you brought us out into the wilderness to kill us. Well, that hasn't worked any other time. But Moses, they come to their senses. We've sinned against God. We've sinned against Jehovah. And against you, they say. Pray for us. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if, the certain, if, the, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. All right, so here is the solution. God can make about any solution that He wants to, but this is foreshadowing. He can, he can make, if, if he wanted to, he could just say, okay, everybody's, everybody's healed, and that's that. Let's go on. He could have done that. He could have made it like with, uh, with Naaman. Everybody who's been bitten, go wash seven times in the Jordan, and you should be fine. He could have done it that way. He could have done it any sort of ways of you, there's a certain sacrifice you've got to make, then you'll be healed. He could have done it that way. But he chose a specific way, and it is foreshadowing the Christ. And here we have this bronze serpent that Moses makes at the command of God, and it is put, it is set on a pole, and for anyone who was bitten, if they look at the bronze serpent, he lives. That's all it required. That's all it required. Could there have been anyone who thought, no, thank you, I don't believe that'll work? There could have been, and they, they would have died. But I doubt anyone would have kept that for too long if once they saw that people were being healed, they would have just gone ahead and, and done it. I don't think that there would have been too many at all if anybody that, that just would have said, no, thank you, I don't want to look at that bronze serpent, and I'll just, I'll just go ahead and die. I don't think anybody, because it looks like they are ready to return back to God in this. Now, let's go to John chapter 3, if you would. John chapter 3. And we want to look at verse 15. I mean, verse 14 first. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. This is Jesus saying this, and he's saying this to Nicodemus, who is a ruler. He is, uh, he is a, um, he has come to Jesus by night, and he is, we know that he is a Pharisee. And Jesus is trying to tell him, um, well, we'll just go back to verse 5. Jesus answering, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. All right, there, there are mysterious things that the world cannot understand, the world can't comprehend. It's spiritually discerned. It's discerned from the Word of God. There are things that do occur at this moment. Nicodemus didn't quite understand what Jesus was saying to him. But we see Jesus talking about, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. There's no way Nicodemus could have known what that meant. No way. And I think that if, if Jesus had spoken this to any scribe, if Jesus had spoken this to his apostles uh, before he had, had, had talked about the fact that he was going to be betrayed, he's going to be uh, tried by uh, the court, he's going to be tried, uh, scribes and the high priests, they're, gonna, they're going to abuse him. And he's going to die and rise the third day. Now, they, I don't think they could have understood what it meant that the Son of Man will be lifted up, but He is. And we see verse 15, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay? There's, he's talked about being born again, and He tries to tell him that you, this is uh, one who is born of water and the Spirit. He's the one that enters the kingdom of God. That's verse 5. And here we have this comparison to Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness that we can be saved through Christ who will also, who was also lifted up. Also lifted up. That bronze serpent being a foreshadowing of just what did it do? Just a local problem, local rebellion. People were, some were bitten by serpents, some died. God gives the solution after they come back saying, we have sinned against Jehovah and against you. Make that bronze serpent, put it on a pole, raise it up, anyone who sees that. All right, so here is the Christ. The Christ will be raised up. He's, and it will be a cross. Now, he doesn't tell Nicodemus that's what it is. But Son of Man will be lifted up. And even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, did they have to have faith, going back to the book of Numbers, did they have to have faith in God that the bronze serpent would heal them by looking at it? Yes, that is correct. Now, do we have to have faith in God that looking toward Christ will heal us, that we will be saved. Yes, but it's, now, the th thing about it is, all right, let's, let's put some things into proper perspective in all this. You and I, we can't see the crucified Christ. That's, that took place in a matter of a few hours, and it's done. By the end of that Friday, you can't see that anymore. That's over with. So we can't take this foreshadowing to, to, uh, to a, the, a strict limitation of just that bronze serpent. All right? Because if we do that, we'd see that the bronze serpent in time became an idol. All right? Jesus is not an idol. But he has already been telling, he's already been telling Nicodemus that of salvation and entering the kingdom of heaven, that one must be born again. And then he tries to tell him, must be born of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. And all this comes together. And now you have the, that the Christ is going to be crucified and, and He's going to be crucified 
so that we can be saved. Are we saved through faith? Yes. Are we saved through faith alone? It wasn't too long ago we were talking about this, I think last week. Martin Luther, German priest, there in, I think it's Romans 3, 28, out of the word alone there, saved by faith alone. And that's not what the Greek says. He added it. Is it by faith alone, as in all we have to do is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? It's more than that. It incorporates that. We should be willing to confess that faith, but it's more than that. Otherwise, this discussion with Nicodemus would have been very different. Very different. Now, we come to verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. We can't just stop there and strip it away from... John chapter 3, because he's already been talking about what it's going to take to be in the kingdom of heaven. He's already, he's already been describing it, what it's going to take to get into the kingdom of heaven. We strip this away from, from John chapter 3 and from the rest of the Bible, we're going to have a, a very flawed view of what salvation is. And as we mentioned last week, John 3.16, John 3, standing on its own, away from the Bible, doesn't answer a lot of questions. For God so loved. Which God? John 3.16 doesn't tell us. But the rest of the Bible does. That He gave His only begotten Son. Who's the Son? John 3.16 doesn't tell us. But the rest of the Bible does. You've got, to, you've got to use the entire text. Now, let's go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And we'll begin... In verse 32. So, we have this foreshadowing that is, that is being identified. And here, the Bible can use, as it often does, it can use its own terminology, its own imagery that was established by previous books. It does that quite a bit. And there are certain books where it is done a lot. And Jesus does it a lot. Jesus ties himself to so many scriptures from the Old Testament. So many. From all of Moses to uh, the major prophets, to the minor prophets, to the Psalms, to the Proverbs. He, he uh, ties himself tightly to the, the history that is, is found in the, in the Old Testament and the prophecies from the Old Testament. Now, Verse 32, so John 12, verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Now, they wouldn't necessarily have been able to put that together until later. And of course, we have the Holy Spirit telling us, giving us uh, an understanding of, of what this meant. But he's saying that if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Okay, did it happen? Well, the first part we know did. Yeah, he was crucified. Yeah, he was lifted up. Did he draw all peoples to himself? Now, that's not saying he's drawing every person because not every person will be drawn. Not every person. Even there on the day of Pentecost, not every person would. There was a whole lot more than 3,000 in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. A lot more than that. But about 3,000 were added to them, added to the church on that day there in Jerusalem. But he doesn't say that every single person would be drawn to him, but he says that all peoples to myself, draw all peoples to myself. Well, has that happened? And the answer to that is yes, it has happened. And we're living testimony to that. Here we are, 2,000 years from the point at which this was said, on the other side of the world, on a completely different continent. You can only get here by way of water. There's 
And here we are. Here we are on the other side of the earth reading these words and worshiping God through Christ and having been brought to God by Him. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. In bringing these parallels together between what occurred in the wilderness with the fiery serpents and the poison that was there uh, and concerning that of the Christ and sin being the solution for sin. We have this in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The poison is still fatal. Now, it's not the, the, you know, the poison of those, of those snakes, of those serpents. All right. That's, that's a poison that would physically kill someone. Okay. And evidently it worked rather rapidly because people were dying from it. That would, that would kill people. But here, sin is a greater problem than those snakes. Much greater problem than those snakes ever were. Those snakes were only for a brief period of time and the solution was given. Sin is worldwide, not just found among some people as a punishment to them. Sin is worldwide. Sin is a poison. And all too often we can think that my sin will only affect me or just a small group, maybe another person, it's only going to affect the guilty, that's it. And actually, no, it spreads. All we have to do is look at David and the life of David, the mistake that, tremendous mistake that David made, and we see the poison that sin is. I call the, that section of David's rule prior to his mistake with Bathsheba as being the golden age of David, the golden age. With David's mistake, it wasn't just between him and Bathsheba. There are, the entire nation was affected. Others were brought in for the deception to lie, and there were people who died, Uriah the Hittite only being one. There were others who died in that. Is that a poison then? Yeah, it's pretty bad, pretty bad poison. Sin is a poison, and it's a poison, though, that God has brought the solution for that. He's brought the solution. Now, while we can make mistakes and we can expect that there will be consequences from those mistakes here on this earth, there doesn't have to be consequences eternally. There doesn't have to be. Will they be? Yeah, if we don't take care of it, there most certainly will be, and it'll be eternal, not just a momentary thing. It'll be eternal consequence, and it will be punishment in hell, eternal punishment in hell, unless we turn. But this poison has the antidote. This poison has precisely what we need, and it took the blood of the Son of God to do it. That sacrifice, that sacrifice for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a gift of God. Sin had been on the earth from the Garden of Eden. And Christ comes upon the earth to defeat it all in the first century. Thousands of years later to take care of it. And His sacrifice took care of sin completely but there are things required by us. There are things required on us. It, it's, it's not enough that He has done it and now everyone's covered. It's not enough to believe that He did it and now you're covered. It's that of having that faith that yes, He did it. He is precisely who the Bible tells Him He, he is, tells us that He is, but that we follow His will. 
faithfully following his will. There is what is known as the law of Christ. I'm not making up that term. That's in the New Testament. There's also the perfect law of liberty. But there's law, there's liberty from that law. Liberty from sin. There's liberty that is given there. But a law, nonetheless, that must be followed. And the law isn't just to just a, 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 a blank kind of faith that, that, uh, or an actionless faith that believes that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, and that He died on the cross, resurrected, ascended into heaven. All right, it's more than that. It's that, but also what Christ has called us to do. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and we see these words given. And this is telling us at the very beginning of this book, the source of this book. Well, verse 1 actually gives us the source of the book, just the first few words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. All right, it's given to an angel, the angel gives it to John. All right, that's how this occurs. But we go to verse 4. We, well, verse 3, we have grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before His throne. Now, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. The antidote is still effective. Now, when John writes this, this isn't just a matter of a few days or just you know a matter of a uh, a couple of years after Jesus ascended into heaven this is toward toward the end of the first century and he is speaking of these things as factual that this has in fact occurred and that this continues to be true that it is it continues to be true in all this, that who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Now, who is He talking to? Who is He writing to? The seven churches of Asia. Does that exclude everyone else? That only the seven churches of Asia are the only ones loved and the only ones who were washed from their sins by the blood of Christ? Well, no, because John's not one of the seven churches of Asia. He's not one of them. And we can look at all the, the other congregations that are through the, the New Testament from Antioch of Syria and, and that of, of Corinth, of course, and the churches of Galatia and Rome itself and Jerusalem itself and Ephesus and all these other places. There's, obviously, the church was on, on, at Cyprus. But we have here the the assurance that this is what is effective and it remains effective that the solution that God has given us is just as valid and just as real as sin itself and that it overpowers sin it is far greater than sin in its effectiveness sin can take a hold on us but with this, we don't have to stand before God guilty of anything. That the blood of Christ cleanses us, cleanses us of all our sins. Now, let's go to Mark 16, 16. Once again, I, from Revelation chapter 1, you know, uh, verse 5, we have this message that, that comes from Christ. Uh, now, Mark 16, these are direct, this is a direct quote of Christ. Not to say that direct quotes are uh, more valuable or that they're more valid than indirect quotes, because they're not. As far as the Bible is concerned, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every bit of it, every bit of it is valuable and every bit of it is true. And here he says... Mark 16, 16, very familiar verse. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, he says this 
as part of the Great Commission. Because he says in verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, the gospel evidently incorporates that of baptism because, and faith, that there must be belief and baptism in order to be saved. It must be there because the conjunction there is the word and. And in the Greek, that word and cannot be changed. That word and is a conjunction. Both of these go together. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. The one who doesn't believe, it doesn't matter what else they do. It doesn't matter if they don't believe. You know, if, if someone who doesn't believe yet decides they're going to get baptized, it's no good because it wasn't done in faith. They, it's just a show is all that is. And someone, most of the people who don't believe, they're not going to bother with baptism anyway. They're not going to do it. Now, let's go to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. And we just see that Jesus is saying something. The, the, the look, what all this comes to is that viewing Christ, viewing Christ who's been lifted up is still effective and still required. It's still required. His gospel is the only way we can look to Christ. As mentioned earlier, when that Friday was complete, when they took him down off the cross, which was before sunset, when they took him down off the cross, that's it. You can't view him on the cross anymore. That's done. So there has to be another way in which this works and that of viewing Christ, and it's by his gospel, which is precisely what he says here in as a part of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The entire Godhead has authorized this. The entire Godhead requires this. To make disciples, what, what do you do? You, you first is mentioned in this is baptizing them. But verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there is that promise that this is going to the end of the age. This is going to the end of the world. There's a promise and there's no stopping it. You can't stop it. Enemies have come, enemies have gone. You've had empires rise and fall, and the church continues. The kingdom of heaven continues. You have what uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his vision of these very powerful world empires, and they crumble. And that rock that was cut without hands grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. Well, that's his church. That's his church that continues on. But he says, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That means you're to teach everything. You're to observe everything that Jesus taught. That would include baptism. That would include faith. That would also include teaching others. It would include that. Uh, that is all part of it. That's all part of what has been given to us. And the Bible doesn't call us to do anything that lowers us as far as our value or any kind of nobility. Every kind of noble act is supported by the biblical text and the character of Christ. Everything. Personal sacrifice, when did that become so ignoble? It is highly admired. When did teaching others become something that was just a common thing and, and you, it's, it's a worthless thing to do? No, it's not. As teachers will tell you, teachers learn more than their students because they've got to. And that act of teaching, you learn more. Well, bringing us all up as teachers means we learn more. And precisely as, as we have there in, in the book of Hebrews, 
with, with the uh, admonition that is given there, going from chapter 5 and into to verse 6. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Okay, so there is not a single thing that Christ calls us to do that isn't worthwhile. Now, going back to, to the, the foreshadowing and, and, the, and going up to the cross, we have the value of looking toward Christ because He is the Savior of all mankind, bar none. None are kept away from this except they just want to be kept away from it. Many are called, few are chosen. Why are few cho chosen? Because there's a lot, one, that won't follow that call. There's a lot that they might for a little bit and then turn away. There's a call to a life. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells the Ephesian brethren to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. There's a calling that is worthy. And it requires more than just an understanding or belief that Jesus exists. It's more than that. It is for us to become the better people. It is us to mature in Christ. And it is just as these words of God are just as profound, just as effective today as, as ever. This morning, we need to look at our own lives. What corrections do we need to make? Let's go ahead and make those corrections. Let's go ahead and make them. There's no need to, to delay. There's no need to just put it off, to, to uh, procrastinate. Just go ahead and make what corrections need to be made. Now, I'll tell you this. If you're not sure what needs to be made, just study more. Just study more, and you will see a way of growing that comes no other way but studying and applying. And this morning, we need to look at our lives in view of judgment that is coming, and it is final judgment. And it's Christ who's going to judge, who's going to judge the world according to the standard. And the standard for us is the New Testament. The standard for us is that perfect law of liberty. We will be judged according to this. And every action, every word, everything we have ever done will be scrutinized. And being obedient to Christ means all our sins are washed away. He becomes our advocate and He, as our Savior, welcomes us into His kingdom and into a home in heaven. This morning, if you need to respond to the invitation, if we can help you in any way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.